a very, very warm, sunny welcome to the LIFT lab, which is Learning Innovation for Tomorrow. Um, we've got an hour and a half this morning and we've got some fabulous stories to share with you. Um, but first of all, just a really warm welcome to everyone that's joining us this morning. There is a, a really great range of people from our university and thank you all for taking the time out. We know how busy a time it is. Um, and also very warm welcome to some of our academic partners. I know we have people in the room from, from local colleges such as South Gloucestershire and Stroud and also particularly warm welcome to our friends and academic partners from University of Economics and Finance in Vietnam. It's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you. Um, so my name is Alex Ryan and I'm Director of Sustainability at the University. This is the annual sharing of the projects that we fund through our LIFT Learning Innovation for Tomorrow Fund, which is projects that we support our colleagues to develop that are going to innovate for sustainability into our learning experiences. So that means trying to bring a triple bottom line learning and thinking into how we are designing and delivering our curriculum. And the stories we've got today actually range across curriculum redesign to learning partnerships with schools in our region, university culture, how do we change that as a learning space? with a particular emphasis on decolonization and online learning for professional development. We've got stories on all these fronts and they are all spaces in which sustainability education happens. So please settle in. We should have a very interesting session with you this morning and we're going to do little bits of hearing from each project and stopping and having questions and answers and an opportunity to discuss. Um, please, would you keep your cameras and mics off? unless you're one of our presenters and you can just switch them on if you're asking a question in the question sessions or please use the chat as well if you'd like to drop comments and questions into the chat Miriam from my team and myself we will look and keep an eye on those questions as they come in um, so just to, before we get going just one quick scene setting comment about sustainability education it's a really transformative, dynamic, very exciting agenda in the education space about bringing not just the new fresh knowledge about sustainability and where our world is going and what we need to do to make life better for people and planet right across the globe. It's about how you take that new knowledge and apply it and deliver learning in a way that will actually develop a capability in people to drive change and to understand what that systemic change looks like in our world and in the different careers and roles that our graduates are going to go into. Um, while the pandemic has been going on, of course, sustainability has been in a quite interesting space. There are plenty of negative impacts coming through all the new amounts of waste that have been generated, the economic devastation we've all experienced, and the really hard hitting social consequences of the pandemic. But at the same time, there have been some real gains for the planet and there has been a reduction in emissions and all this online working and learning that we're doing now does drive our emissions down, which is helping in tackling climate change in this critical decade. Now, and there's also, you know, a significant way in which people are appreciating differently their relationship with nature. And sustainability education is trying to really respond to that. And in higher education, we are seeing an increasing presence and significance of this agenda. There's a UN led initiative to bring sustainability education into all aspects of education. It's been going on for 15 years now, and there's a new initiative now to just take the third step in the development of this into all countries and education settings across the world. When we get going, I'll drop a link into the um, chat box for people who want to find out more about that. And in university sector, in the UK, we're actually very well blessed in the fact that our Quality Assurance Agency has been driving this agenda for more than 10 years and has just released national guidance and has also released a drive to embed this into every single curriculum framework benchmark statement 
for the quality and standards of all our different subject disciplines. So over this next 10 years, we are going to see this great big idea about a transformative education brought down to real practice in all of our disciplines. My colleagues who are here today to tell you their stories have already got started. So we've got some great things to hear about. And this is a space that's now getting really interesting. So without any further ado, I would just like to give a really warm thanks to all of our colleagues this year who have persevered with their projects through the pandemic and continued them into this year. Um, I'll introduce each of them briefly and then we can get straight into their presentations. Um, so first of all, we're going to hear from two projects together, 10 minutes from each of them, and then stop and have a quick question and answer. Um, first of all, we're going to hear from my colleagues, Amy Lily Stewart and Margaret McDonough. They're in our School of Education and Fashion Design. Um, and they have been working with a local schools partnership where there's a huge interest in sustainability. And their project, Counting Threads, is engaging students and their teachers in how to do fashion education for sustainability. Over to you, Amy and Margaret. Thank you, Alex. Margaret, are you there? Yes, I am. Sorry, I was just, um, <laughs> just getting the slides up. OK, can you see the slides? Yes, that's looking good for me. Hopefully for everyone else too. Yes. Brilliant. OK. Um, I'll, I'll let you start, I think, Amy, just to introduce the, um, the, the sort of overall kind of um, how this happened and, and, uh, and then I'll pick up from the perspective of the actual project, if that's OK. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so welcome, colleagues. Um, this has been a really exciting project um, for us to work on, and it's been for me an absolute privilege to work with Margaret in the School of Art and Design. Um, and also with the sustainability team. Um, the, the initial idea of this project was um, initiated through the work that we do with the Cheltenham Educational Partnership, which is a relatively new partnership. Um, it is basically a partnership of secondary schools across Cheltenham, um, where the schools have come together. They're working with the university, Cheltenham festivals, a couple of other organisations that are quite key players in Cheltenham with the overarching aim to inspire and support our young people in Cheltenham through a variety of educational opportunities. Um, so two years ago, there was a project where we brought children from across Cheltenham schools together um, to think about issues around sustainability. Um, and there was a real drive and interest from the students to really make a difference in their schools about how they could be more sustainable. Through those conversations and that project, um, it was really interesting. They were very keen to discuss some of the issues around school uniform. Um, and that kind of started the conversation with Alex. And Alex said, well, I know that Margaret's been doing this fantastic work um, on sustainable fashion. Um, and that's how the conversation started with how we developed this project. Um, Margaret, is that enough for me to give a brief overview? Because I can talk a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's fine. And, and what I've done on this slide is just highlight. So we've got a list of the schools um, that are part of the CUP. And I've just highlighted in red those that are, are kind of actively involved this year. But we've we've sort of um, reached out to all of them. And hopefully we continue to do that and build this. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Amy. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so just um, a, a brief explanation of uh, this concept of Thread Counts. So Thread Counts was a project that came from earlier LIFT funding, uh, which was uh, developed to address some of the big problems within the fashion industry. Um, the, the main purpose a, a, around it, I guess, was to put the course, fashion design course at the University of Gloucestershire at the centre of um, you know, everything that was happening around fashion and sustainability, whether it was local industry, national industry, um, collaborative partners, uh, but also, um, you know, schools and, and uh, other sort of educational outlets. So really putting this idea of um, all things sustainable in fashion and textiles at the, the heart of it. Um, and there have been several iterations of projects that we've done with students 
um, over the years. Uh, one of the first big launch involved a community project as well. So we're, we're very sort of um, focused on trying to engage with a range of, of, of partners. Um, this particular year, um, we've focused it around the idea of school uniforms. Um, as, as Amy has explained, it's obviously a, 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 a really kind of um, relevant element of, of working with school children. Um, but the concept was really about bringing the principles of that education for sustainability experience through the curriculum. And I have um, embedded this within the course again this year. What always excites me um, about this project, even though it sort of had different um, guises over the years, is the way in which the focus changes depending on those who are contributing to it or collaborating with it, whether it's our first year students, um, whether it's community partners, and hopefully we're going to see, um, you know, some some real contributions from from students in in secondary schools as well, and and really get to understand their take on this topic. Um, so yeah, we've um, challenged the, the project is essentially to challenge pupils to design and make wearable fashion items from used secondhand uh, school uniform shirts. We're focusing on on shirts in the main. However, you know we have proven um, within this year's level four project that that can be expanded into other items of clothing mm. and um, with, with some great success actually. So one of the key elements of this year's sort of iteration of the project is I've, we've actually engaged, um, apart from the teacher training uh, students of from Amy's course, we've um, invited a couple um, of our current level four students to be part of the project as well, in particular because those students um, are very keen to consider going into education following their um, degree course. So in a way this year the, the, the focus has changed again um, in that it's not just sort of about feeding into schools but actually Universe, the university courses themselves feeding into each other, which is really exciting. Um, but the intended outcomes are, you know, we've got a target audience of 14 to 18 year olds from CEP schools who are passionate about fashion or and or sustainability. Um, the project itself will run across three days within the fashion design studios at the university, which is kind of important because that gives um, a, a sort of professional context to um, the, the project. It's about knowledge building around these important sort of dynamic factors of fashion consumption, uh, the impact of fashion on the environment and um, widening the understanding of the, the this life cycle of, of clothing in general, but, but also about the school uniform. Um, we're hoping to uh, develop some skills in um, some really you know, creative ways and uh, technical drawing skills. And also back to that point uh, I made earlier about this cross-course, cross-generational collaboration, collaborative experience to support that ongoing professional development. Um, I've said a little bit about it. So it's a three-day event. Um, day one is mostly inductions and um, setting the brief. Day two will be about the challenge of the uh, production and development of the garments. And on day three, we're hoping to provide um, the opportunity for the students to exhibit their work. And um, we're also gonna film the work and, and hopefully the filming of the projects will form part of that legacy, which will feed back into um, schools and potentially a project uh, development for next year. Um, it's important that the, the concept of the project and the aims of the project link to wider influences within uh, fashion futures. So there are links uh, and principles that have uh, derived from um, this UAL's um, Centre for Sustainable Design and their developments around workshop activities um, designed to engage students. So that's kind of important to us. 
and I've sort of expanded it this year as well, where we're, we're going to look at some uh, further links that uh, schools can use beyond the project in relation to um, websites and concept developments that are happening up and up and down the country around this topic. Uh, so um, there's, a, there's a zero waste project in uh, run by Leeds Council, which is about, you know, uh, school uniforms and uh, the Love Your Clothes website has a particular site, uh, some workshops dedicated to actually, you know, looking after, you know, clothing, uh, particularly school uniforms to make them last longer. Uh, interestingly, school uniforms are actually some of the most more sustainable garments that we own because of the way they, that we wear them. We wear them continually, um, but we still need to care for them and make them last that bit longer. Um, and finally, uh, just touching on the legacy. So we aim to grow the project, uh, grow its reach into primary schools and other local secondary schools. Um, the idea is fundamentally to train student ambassadors and um, to get them involved with delivering projects on a, on a wider basis and, um, and potentially taking it into primary schools in the future. And uh, there are sort of further links about the, the work we've done there uh, in the past around red counts. Uh, Thank you very much. Wrong. And so I'm just going to hand over to Tom I I now. Thank you, and I'll I'll introduce Tom because I didn't realise before I I forgot to do that, but I will just give you a brief intro to Tom. Thank you so much, Margaret and Amy, and everybody. If you're hearing strange noises, this is the singing bowl that saves our timings today. Um, so thank you both for that and it's a great project that's really trying to address the gap that actually exists in sustainability education in a school level which is very much around a gap that we then receive at higher education level when we're then trying to work on whole course design that can really bring our students forward and send them out into the world as very sustainability competent graduates and our Nuto to do exactly that in the music business course and they have going to tell you a little bit about a whole course redesign approach that has very dynamically involved students as well as big industry partners who are really trying to develop their own professional practice on the ground. Over to you Tom. Thanks very much Alex. I'm just uh, going to try and set up the share of my screen. Can I please just check with everyone that you can see the slides here? Yes, great. that's great, Tom, thanks. Okay, thank you. So yes, Sostenuto, um, which kicked off probably about two years ago, um, was originally founded within the music business course, but is starting to expand already to take in um, the music and sound subject group and the media school and other courses more widely. Um, the media school here has got three subject groups, music and sound, journalism, film, television, animation. Um, and within the music and sound subject group, the popular musicians who make, write and create, the sound and music uh, technicians, producers and the music business students. But it's important to be aware that the music business um, course has always been extremely interactive and dynamic across other media, other practices, other industries, other skills particularly around new tech or around working with um, other practitioners. So that helps. And also to say that there were several aims for this project, but what I'm trying to concentrate on for this presentation is about that course change process. So I might talk about some teaching and learning or some trying out some ideas, but that's that's where it's leading us. So I'm going to look first of all at the project concept and mission. OK, some of the key goals and what the student experience wanted to be, or what they were requiring. Um, what we actually did in overview, explaining how that starts to relate to the course and course change. Some other dimensions of how we introduced, um, I'd say, evolution and maybe even tried something. And just finish off with a final slide that looks at the idea of what the significance of this is, what the impact has been and what we're now thinking of doing in the future. OK, so first of all, in terms of um, the basic sort of mission, I think really we wanted to start pulling our weight. Um, we, it's, it's, it's often, um, what we can often do is look at problems that exist out there and sort of not quite understand the significance of what they mean, 
in our own backyard or in our own industries. And around about 2019, um, the picture on there was all about, we go to these wonderful Glastonbury's and Reading's and Leeds festivals, and something like 17% of the tents were being left behind. And this became a very um, well-known sort of fact, that image went everywhere. Um, and not specific perhaps towards the music business, but in and around some new technologies, in a sense, future leaning um, areas of the music business. I'll, I'll deal with smart contracts a little later. Um, the carbon footprint print, for instance that bitcoin has had you know even now we're evolving less sort of resource and energy sapping um technologies there but the key goals for us there was a trigger around us taking responsibility for that because there's quite a lot of project management and student leadership of projects that takes place on the course so our goals were that they can be proactive design make things and lead on some projects that we can see some opportunities that exist and we know that they exist in industry starting locally in Cheltenham and across Gloucestershire, um, and but as you'll see later, already growing to sort of a national and international reach that the University of Gloucestershire now has through this. Um, and also, um, and not necessarily least, the idea that this is the industry and these are the um, environments that our students are going to be employable within in the very near future, in fact, already. And so the more work that we can do in this area and the more confidence, experience and knowledge they have here, um, the more likely they are to prosper in their own careers. Um, in terms of the experience, before I move on, um, our students were really keen to make the new industry. We've had lots of conferences, media festival appearances, consultations with, with companies. And when the students, our students pitch, they're really, really um, energised. They're really um, committed to the idea of using three years of university to help create the new music business. And so that's really important. They want to do that change. And we're very keen that they get a chance to sort of take leadership roles in this as well and, and, and learn different styles. I think the, this slide is, is a little bit more, I can, I can ping through this a little bit more. The process to get us there, we had dialogue sessions in two different ways with our students across all years, just ask them what they would like to change, what they'd like to change about the course in the industry. Therefore, what can we start trialing in our modules already? And that generated further workshops, outputs, plans, uh, discussions, which started to filter in around, we have a, a student representative scheme, nearly all um, education institutions do. And it came into our course development meetings themselves, which led on already to, to trialing some uh, tweaks in assessment and also looking at the learning outcomes overall. So if you've got that sort of sense of the structure of a course or a program, we were starting in a way in lots of different areas at once, trying to get a feel for this. And I've just put an, an example there of a very early, say 2018, 2019 example of a 45 minute or an hour workshop and discussion we might introduce into our events, music events management module um, at level five, review the UN sustainable development goals, identify appropriate areas of planning and practice within your projects and prepare a sustainability vision statement. So that would be example of perhaps an activity that we were starting to test out in some, particularly some of our pr practical and our project management modules. But there are other dimensions. I think I'd like to introduce that um, I've been teaching on a module at MA level um, called Creativity in Context, where I'm thinking about these very grand projects and how do they um, market themselves? How do they reach audiences? How do they reach communities? So I'd be working with them on the concept of responsible leadership. Um, some very interesting uh, theory, but also some quite inspiring stuff where there's a still, if you ask particularly young people to think about what leadership means, they're wrapped up in this very old fashioned, great man approach to leadership. Um, and of course, there are so many other um, styles, approaches, um, more distributed, more consensual, more uh, to do with the community taking responsibility. So that might start in the MA, but then it cas cascades down to a final year and then it cascades down to a level five. And I think I was talking about this stuff at level four um, after two or three years. So I think that's one factor we can think about during course change. Things come down, they, they, they sort of cascade. Um, we're interested in facilitating more share culture of basic resources, instruments, tech kit. Um, we're introducing in our law and copyright modules. Um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of that in the music business degree um, to look at new transparent rights management technologies and tools, which are much less resource sapping, but also um, more equitable in terms of the share between various creative partners and practices. 
in the production company in the final year, they started out by going to consult with all lots of very famous local venues, Stroud Subrooms, um, Gloucester um, Guildhall, um, two or three places, Town Hall included in Cheltenham. And though at first they were, this is the, the, the students themselves, consulting to help them reopen live music safely in the pandemic, which has evolved over time through the confidence and experience there to start to offer sustainability uh, in a sense, consultancy or services um, to a very, very large music company indeed. Um, still embargoed on that one. <laughs> um, but it's reached the point now where they're doing um, carbon you know, use and energy use assessments for um, the vans, the food vans that exist in these massive festivals like Reading and Leeds, for instance, which in turn has already, again, embargoed, but already sort of crossed over to the ability that work experiences and placements have been generated from this which is that lovely line of connection that you'd be looking for. So just to sum up on the course change process, that comes across in several fronts at once. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're basically, we're trying things out. So you get started as, as, at the same time as you're having your rethink and your discussion. Lots of initiatives are driven by the students. They say, we want to do X, Y, and Z. And so you create that. Or I need to know more about this in order that we can pursue this project to its logical conclusion. So the beautiful thing of the tutors and the lecturers having to learn up and getting that community going. Um, obviously, a lot of design, discussion, reject, refine um, at all levels of the course, from individual assessments to modules to strands of the programme. Um, and just on this final slide here, at the bottom there, it's not the most fascinating graphic. Um, but just to give you a sense, what you're looking at there in micro is three levels of the course five vertical strands or columns of the course, for instance, marketing and enterprise. Um, uh, you know, it, uh, so I don't want to get them right, so I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at them right now. Sort of music business and intellectual property and law, which we've clustered together. And so there'll be a progression down from level what, um, four, five, six, years one, two and three. And you've also got that sort of synoptic or sideways view, which we all understand in our courses of, um, you know, trying to think what would this change or evolution in the course happening here in this sort of strand or area of the course affect or support or buttress um, what's happening in, a, in another area. Um, so just to give you a sense how this, a lot of this work all comes in and we're now at this point of getting some great employability outcomes come out of this, the preparation for the future is looking great. I think in September, the induction process for the new year is gonna be a, at a whole nother level um, and we're now having uh, submitted through a course change process changes to modules and, uh, and to learning outcomes and some of the very macro course design elements. Um, thank you, Alex. Um, we're starting to think about specific assessments and assessment strategy. Um, but I think the biggest impact really in terms of the culture of the course is um, that these sorts of questions are not things now that are ever not asked. And the context that we're looking at here, um, sustainability context never ignored at, in any uh, area or, or part of the course. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. It's really, really interesting. It's a very, very rich project, this one. And I think hopefully I didn't I don't think I gave away the name of your big partner, did I? In my intro must have been instinctive. I didn't realize that was still on embargo. Um, everybody, um, please feel free to raise a hand if you do have a question right now, because we're just going to take a small break um, for a few minutes and have an opportunity to for five minutes or so of questions on these two projects. There'll be some other chatting opportunities as we go along the rest of the hour. So don't worry if you're not quite ready to frame a question yet. Um, I don't see any hands up right straight away, which is great because I'd really like to ask a question. Um, and it's to both of you in these projects. Oh, actually, Margaret's got a question. OK, Margaret, do you want to ask Tom something? Yeah, if, if that's OK. So Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I was really interested about the course design element of these these particular strands across the course. Did that arrive out of course team discussions or was that led by these UN sort of uh, the UN framework around that? How, how was that first sort of muted as an idea? Because I think it's a really exciting. I can see lots of kind of resonance with the fashion course about how we might move to something like that? 
I think more the former than the latter, but there are actually sort of perhaps three or four um, feed-ins to the course change process um, and things like sustainable development goals and also the new, I think the newly released national guidance, which gives us really great support and help um, in terms of how we consider this whole process. I think I would add also the degree to which the students are um, encouraged, empowered to kind of make suggestions themselves from their own uh, experience of the course. Um, but I think to get started somehow, somewhere, there was that idea of that the course team wanted to set out a few ideas and start to work with them initially. Great. Thank you. Thanks. It's really interesting. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks, Margaret. Yeah, it's really interesting. And the student involvement in shaping this project has been something that's actually very exciting. It sort of connects very much with the question I really wanted to ask both of you, which is about how that sort of professional development insight journey works when you've got these different people contributing to the learning because with both of your projects, you've got the students putting their voice directly into what they want to learn and bringing their own ideas to the table, whether it's the university students or the secondary school students. You've got the professionals, whether they're the industry partners or the school teachers, and yourselves as the academic professionals. And it's always been a tenet of sustainability education that this is a new competence. None of us were taught it. None of us really know what it is. We're all learning how to do it together. And we've got to learn together, young, old, different backgrounds. We've got to all learn together really fast because the world's changing fast around us. and We haven't got an awful lot of time. So I think what I'm really interested to just hear a quick thought from both of you on, maybe Amy wants to go first and then Tom, is about how you see that, that um that quickening happening through those different voices all trying to get at this thing and learn it together how do you see that working does it work well what's interesting or difficult or brilliant about it i think with the project that margaret and myself are working on um it's really interesting working with secondary school pupils because they're very much wanting to work towards the agenda of making change um, and the thing that I find with the conversations I'm involved with, with the school, with colleagues in schools and the students, is there's a conflict because the students will have these brilliant ideas and they'll try and implement it in the school and there'll be these barriers that they're not able to do it because of the way that the school is set up and structured. But what's been really interesting this year um, when we invited people to be a part of the project, we, we've had to turn people down. And that's including staff. So staff have asked to come with the students to come on site. Poor Margaret, <laughs> there's going to be lots of people in the room. Um, we've actually had to limit the amount of people that want to take part in our project. Um, so to me, that's completely different to what happened last year. Um, it was quite challenging and I know it was COVID first wave and everything. Mm -hmm. But that was a different mentality last year. So I think there is a real appetite for it and everybody is definitely moving more towards this agenda. So it's been really interesting this year to see how they've responded to the project. And we haven't done it yet, we're doing it in a few weeks time. So we'll be able to report back. Um, and I think what I would add is that from the very start, partly because of a culture that we've already worked quite hard to set up within the course, um, but partly also because it's the truth and um, it's very important to, to have this sort of uh, transparency and honesty is that we said to them we're all doing this together from the very start and you're going to see your lecturers um, make some mistakes we're going to make some public mistakes we're going to debate we're going to get things wrong and we're going to try and help you um, in terms of the students putting their voice in directly um, again I'd say that's something that really the course is designed to do because they're supposed to be designing developing project managing leading on um, all kinds of projects particularly from the second year onwards but if, if a student, frankly, ever comes to um, me or my colleague, Andrew, particularly, who, who work in the practical areas and says, we'd like to do this, then we get we get that started. So mm -hmm. it happens immediately. And I think um, I do very much take Amy's point about sometimes there are structural elements to the way that the education is set up in an institution, which can sort of militate against that. And um, so, I mean, the modules we may have in terms of assessment 
scope or what you do, we actually have already designed to say, you'll be setting up and running a project which will have these qualities to it, but some of the specific stuff is, is deliberately left open so students have that space to walk into. Thanks, Tom. I think, and thanks both of you, actually. I think you've both really expressed there what we see in the literature, which is this appetite and this hunger, not just for the knowledge, but for the change amongst the younger generation, particularly. And, you know, I, I saw, I was listening to the Environmental Audit Committee from March, where the NUS were talking to them about this skill need and the urgency of it and the, the requirement for it amongst young people. And they were they were sort of saying that within a secondary school context, that some of their surveys showing 68% of students wanting this and 75% of teachers feeling they haven't had the professional development to deliver it. And like you said, Tom, the, be the best way to do it is just to admit that we're all going to just learn on the job and let's get to it. So thank you both, because I'm very aware that both of your projects have been very authentic in how you've taken that learning forward together on the ground very proactively. Um, Please keep feeling free to drop any comments onto the chat because we'll move on to the next project now. Um, but we will have, again, another little pause and another one after that as we go along the rest of this um, last hour. Um, so our next project, we're going to hear from our colleagues in the business school, um, Charles, Mohammed, and Sam. I think all three of them are going to speak. Um, and this is a project that has been about changing practice and culture across the university on the topic of decolonizing learning. Now, you will have heard in this Festival of Learning that um, our equality and diversity agenda is a really big concern for us this year. We've been making a lot of um, strides and step changes to really move our university forward on this agenda. Um, Decolonizing learning particularly has always been a natural interest of sustainability educators. And it's been one of our lift principles from the start of this initiative many years ago. Um, and that's because sustainability education is really fundamentally about deliberately seeking to understand how unsustainable development affects people disproportionately around the world when the exploitation of natural resources and the labour and economic practices that go with that are affecting different communities and affecting them differently. Um, so there's a critical pedagogy that is very shared between those who are now very visibly pushing the decolonizing learning agenda and those who are very visibly pushing the sustainability education agenda. These two things are very joined up. And if any of you um, were fortunate enough to hear the discovery lecture um, a few weeks back from Foluke Adebisi in Bristol, she had a really excellent way of showing that joined upness of these two agendas of sustainability and equality. Um, and that's exactly the way that we need to be thinking about this. It's a triple bottom line approach to understanding how people and planet and profit all intersect. Um, the Decolonizing Learning Project has been trying to affect some change university wide. They started last year and really framed the project, started engaging with people and groups around the university. They put together some really excellent resources. What we're about to hear about now um, is some practice based stuff. So um, Charles, Mohammed, and Sam are going to tell us a little bit about how they've actually been changing some of the modules that they teach and what does it actually look like to decolonize your curriculum particularly. If we have time, maybe they can tell us a little bit of their thoughts in the Q&A about the bigger cultural piece around this. But I'll say over to them, they've got about 20 minutes to um, tell us a little bit about what they've been up to. Thank you, chaps. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for that introduction. Um, hopefully, Mohammed and Charles will join me. Uh, unfortunately, um, there is another member of the group who can't make it uh, today, uh, Adila Shafi, um, and we usually come as a four, uh, so it's quite unusual to kind of uh, just be the three of us. Um, she's a very important part of our, our group and, and we kind of naturally work together as a, as a collective, as a hive mind, as it were. Um, and uh, so it's a shame she can't be with us today. But so um, we're going to talk today about 
uh, two modules that we uh, worked on. Uh, Adila had worked on a module as well as part of her part of the, the project. Um, so I've done one module and Charles and Mohammed have done another. Um, I will just share my screen with you guys now just to um, show you uh, as we talk through um, what we actually managed to do. Uh, so just to kind of uh, recap, although Alex has very kindly kind of uh, described the project incredibly well anyway, uh, that um, for uh, phase two of the project, and we're, we've, we're actually uh, kind of on phase three at the minute, uh, that um, the, the idea of this phase was to create some practical guidelines on how to decolonize a, a module, um, partly because uh, we, we sort of wanted to challenge ourselves uh, in in this, and uh, in order to, in in having these discussions around the university about what decolonizing is, um, we kind of had to also look inwards at ourselves and kind of look at um, how our practice is affected by a, a post-colonial system and the way. In Sorry, our... Sam, the slides aren't showing. By the way, a couple of people have just said. Oh, um... Here we go. Technical. technical yeah, one, isn't might it? be one of those going into presenter mode things. I had the same thing when I was doing a management presentation just a week ago. Is that working now? Yes, there they are. Brilliant. OK, <laughs> fantastic. Um, so, yeah, just like a lecture. Um, and so what we tried to do is then affect our own modules and change our own modules and then see how, you know, see how we could then advise other people about how they could go around uh, decolonizing their own modules. And um, of course, we approach this with the understanding that everybody has got uh, different subject areas and those subject areas are taught in different ways and have different approaches, have different types of content and that there wasn't going to be just a kind of uh, a rubber stamp approach to this. Um, and, and we didn't want that either. Uh, we wanted um, everybody to kind of approach it in their own way. Um, and by doing this kind of across these different modules, we hope to kind of inspire and show people um, how they might approach it. So um, just to kind of uh, start off with myself, um, I took a level four module, um, MS4106 social media channels, and uh, looked at how we could kind of uh, decolonize this. And the, the lecture kind of, uh, or the module kind of consists of uh, a, a lecture, a seminar session, and a simulation and uh, just to give a shout out to Matt Barr who also teaches it with me who's uh, who's with us today I saw uh, in the participants but uh, so Matt and I kind of looked at how we could um, uh, change the content of this and, and kind of give it uh, a, a decolonized approach and so what we wanted to do really is to um, take it take social media and, and the way that people think about social media and kind of look at it from a more, much more international uh, viewpoint and perspective and also the uh, the, the um, literature around that as well. And so what we did was we came up with a challenge for the students to, uh, as, as part of their assignment, to look at how they would promote a brand uh, a, a made up brand that we use as part of the simulation that we do with them, how they would promote that across three different uh, countries. So we took the UK, uh, Singapore and Japan. Three uh, similar kind of countries in many different ways and three very uh, different countries in, in many different ways. Um, but all three island countries, uh, all three have um, quite similar kind of social structure structures but quite different uh, kind of cultural elements to them and so their challenge was to kind of think about how they were going to use social media uh, to promote this uh, the same product across those three different uh, countries but also to look at the literature around uh, social media and behaviors and to to kind of identify uh, where the gaps were in helping them to achieve this goal and so in doing this what we kind of uh, managed to get out of it uh, was really quite interesting because because it was something that the students really um, weren't kind of used to it it kind of actually increased the levels of engagement that we got and I think what I found really interesting to to look at was that 
these students are absolutely net natives um, but they're also I think social media natives when you think um, you know scaringly uh, when you think about how um, how young <laughs> they all are now um, that um, you know they've grown up in a world uh, where social media has been part of their lives since they were children so um, for them social media is something that's very natural to them and yet what was really interesting is that they had absolutely no un understanding at all of the trends or the platforms or the user groups that were uh, using uh, social media in the other two countries they're very familiar with a kind of western viewpoint and, and kind of very aware of the trends that are going on in america and the uk um, and all those kind of things and very aware of the platforms that are being used and all those kind of things. But when it came to uh, Singapore and Japan, they had absolutely uh, no idea. And so what was really interesting was to watch them kind of then uh, discover that and to kind of go through that journey of them uh, kind of uh, finding out about those different cultures. And that led to lots of different kind of kinds of discussion about that. Um, and kind of discussing about uh, what what trends were, were running, how they would find out about those trends, um, how they would become aware of different types of behaviours. And then what was really uh, kind of in, uh, interesting as well was to look at the kind of literature uh, that they could use in their assignment. And as part of their assignment, like I said, they were trying to identify gaps in that literature. And um, it was what was very apparent is that there is an absolute focus on Western uh, kind of behaviors and uh, benchmarks and uh, kind of uh, method methods. Um, and there is very, very little that you have to look very hard for it to find anything about non-Western um, behaviors and benchmarks and things. And so what it also uh, did was it challenged the students to be able to understand outgroups as well. And, and I think that's a really important part of their development and particularly for marketing students is that um, they always kind of conceive consumers as being the groups that they belong to. So whenever we ask them kind of, you know, who would be your target market, they always kind of go, oh, well, 18 to 25 year olds, you know, university students, etc. And this really pushed them out of their comfort zone and made them kind of look at um, different groups. And so that was really good. And I think, um, you know, from that experience, they've come to um, reevaluate the way in which they look at the world and um, so the world of social media as well. So that was my module. I've done enough um, talking. I'll hand over to my colleagues. Thank you, Sam. Um, yes, so for our module, obviously for, I mean, Charles and I, we were in, um, um, we are in accounting, the accounting course, um, which is a course that is known to be looking at standards and really not giving people the leeway to actually, um, you know, explore some of the creativity and so and so. So, again, for us, it was looking at the actual question of decolonizing curriculum within the context of accounting, uh, which may be different to the context of another module, but at the same time also to understand that this is sort of a first iteration as well. Um, and decolonizing curriculum is something that is continuous. Um, I think earlier on in the previous um, presentation, they talked about how there are some structures um, in education that basically, in a sense, freezes what you can do and what you can't do. So for our module, we actually selected the professional skills one. Um, and really what we wanted to do was we wanted to change completely um, the approach to looking at things. Um, and when I say the approach to looking at things, it was really understanding um, how the, the, the actual students basically were sort of understanding accounting um, and how prepared, because the way in which you define a module is a way in which some most of the time, I mean, it has an impact on how you approach that module. So here, what we really wanted to do was to change completely the approach. So it was to create, I mean, promote interactive and free thinking, um, to promote class debates, group work and strong work ethics. Um, and also more importantly, to really expand minds in a sense. 
Um, and for them to start understanding a little bit what represents knowledge and what represents, um, you know, um, an opinion. So really starting to bring them into the world of research as well, because we are a third, um, we are a higher education institution, and therefore students basically need to be close to that as well. So in doing all of this, what we've be really been trying to do is creating these little um, points of connection with the diversity of students that we have. Um, obviously, we have mature students, we have young students, we have um, students from different ethnic backgrounds, um, et cetera, et cetera, from different countries. So really trying to create connections. And by trying to do all of this, what we decided to do was to allow the students to choose the group work that they would sort of focus on. I mean, a project, um, choose whatever project. They did initially struggle to come up with that. They struggled with the freedom, you know, the weird freedom that they were afforded within this module, which was in complete contrast to whatever was having, happening in the rest of the program. Um, but in the end, they came around basically doing things that were really interesting to them. And that's what we were trying to do. We were trying to do, um, we were trying to lead them to use their own passions um, to apply in their learning and then trying to draw the accounting part of it, which meant even for us, it was a learning um, curve because we had to adapt to whatever project, knowing that we wouldn't know which project would come up. So some of them basically chose projects around knife crime in London, how to, I mean, why is it happening? And so and so, what are possible solutions? So that group, for example, would have looked at uh, some of the economic reasons behind it, et cetera, et cetera, the, the different ethnic backgrounds and so on. So another group chose to look at, I mean, the one that was most fascinating probably is the one that chose to look at how to solve uh, the problem of water shortage in Uganda. That group had no Ugandan in there. Um, but it just shows a little bit how much people want to, I mean, how, how much they were aware of certain challenges around the world and how they wanted to actually potentially bring their own solutions and try to tackle it. Um, and for me, for us at least, some of the observations that we had were, as we say here, education breeds confidence, confidence breeds hope, hope breeds peace uh, from Confucius. Um, and it was all designed also to create confidence because as I've got in the fourth point of the approach, we had the challenge of teacher Tuesday um, scheme, which was a mad thing. We will see the pictures later on, um, but which brought the students a little bit closer um, to us, which in a sense was our way of challenging those education structures um, that we talked about earlier on in the previous in the previous in the previous presentation, but the conclusions that we basically had after that iteration was that you know the students do like to explore their interests. I mean that is something that is um, obviously for for all of us as human beings. The more the closer we work around our interests, our values, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, the more engaged we are in it, I mean, and the more really we want to push it further. Um, however, it, because of these structures, because of the understanding that accounting generally is, you know, um, this, I mean, uh, well, sort of forces you to look at an Excel spreadsheet, for example, and just focus on that. Because of that mindset, because of um, that sort of belief, uh, people tend to really see accounting in a different way, which means even if, I mean, at initially when we sort of brought, um, when we started with this module, as I said earlier on, a lot of students were very lost because every other module in the program was teaching them in a certain way, in a way that is known to be the accountant's way. Um, whereas this one was, you know, suddenly affording them a whole lot of, um, you know, of, of, of freedom, which at first they were not comfortable with. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? Sam? 
Right. So this is a little bit some of the pictures of the challenge your I mean your tutor Tuesday, uh, which we had. So it was a bit of a madness um, idea in a sense, but there was a method in the madness. So some of these challenges here. I mean, the first one was a challenge in terms of trying to guess which sound. Um, you know, if they had their Spotify thing and they just wanted us to guess some sounds. Some of them were some music, I mean, music songs. Some of them were um, very recent, obviously. One of them was a dancing challenge. Another one was a skipping challenge. We played football with them. And yes, again, it's all about trying to bring them, um, trying to connect with all of them um, in their different ways, in their different interests and so on. And, so. and all of that sort of led us to the last um, picture, which is really a an engagement that is greater. I mean, and also an interaction between students that is also greater because one of the things that we have identified in the in the university is that sometimes you get clusters of students um, separating each other in a sense. Um, so with, without further ado, I'll basically pass on to Charles uh, for the for, for the for the rest of the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. So to, to round this up, uh, this is a 30 card module, as Mohammed said, on the accounting uh, course. So it's essentially a quarter of the first year and professional skills, very traditional module. Uh, we decided it was three of us. It was myself, Mohammed and Archan. And we really decided to rethink that module in the context of sustainability and decolonization. So what we did was we, we took a very top-down approach between us uh, collaboratively, uh, planning uh, which are some of the troublesome concepts and threshold competences that we think will permeate all the, the, the modules and, and the professional practice of the students as as they engage with accounting at this level. So we decided to, to adopt sustainability as, as the main theme, uh, which meant that uh, as, as our previous colleagues did, the first session was about the, the UN sustainability goals. We adopted that because that fitted nicely with the learning outcomes of the module, uh, exploring the role of accounting in society. And, and that then, I mean, pushed us to rethink the topics and the, the activities that we do in the 12 sessions. So all the activities, every mad thing we did was somehow themed around sustainability and kind of pushing the center, decentering and really expanding the curriculum, ensuring that in every activity that we had designed, loosely of course, we, we provided opportunity for the students to engage both cognitively and emotionally, uh, because that's really, uh, we, we, we appreciate part of the, the, the idea of helping them develop their own knowledge structures. And it did work. It, it meant that we had to rethink the types of resources that we made available it was very uncomfortable because these resources went there uh, ready-made in, in, in the shape and form that we, uh, we needed to use them. And interestingly, as Mohammed said, because we gave the students the, the, the freedom to choose which of the UN developmental goals they wanted to explore throughout the module, it meant that they also had ownership of the assessment task. So we, we had written the, I mean, the marking descriptor in a very generic form, ensuring that the key skills that they needed to develop, which was problem articulation and exploring the, the foundations of the, the knowledge around the problem, actually empirically going to collect data and analyze it in, in the way and manner that traditionally accountants would, and, and coming up with reasonable solutions to that problem, it did really energize them. So as Mohammed said, we had a very broad diversity of novel problems that we were all of a sudden uh, talking about in an accounting class. 
Right, so we have people talking about providing safe drinking water in Uganda. Uh, another cluster of students were talking about knife crime in the UK. We had another group talking about education and technology in the UK. We had some, uh, some another group talking about cost and benefit of solar energy. And we had another group exploring child safety on social media platforms. So it was it was so exciting and the whole atmosphere uh, was owned by the students, of course, with us playing uh, our role as facilitators of learning, uh, it gave them the opportunity to come up and present. Obviously, those who needed to use various software uh, were able to do that. Believe me or not, we had people doing coding and using R and, and, and all these emerging technology in fetching data from different parts of the world. But, but the most important thing, I think, was the, the ownership and the rigor that the students were able to bring to solving these problems and being confident to talk about it, connecting it with the, the, the impact on, on people and society in different parts of, of, of the world. What did we learn? Well, we, uh, I think we had butterflies in our tummy a few times, the irreducible uncertainty, not knowing what the students will bring into, into the seminar, uh, which meant that we, we were always uh, on our feet, needing to learn and needing to embrace and provide critique and support. Uh, we were able to, to see some of the, the very exciting sides of the, the accounting concepts that the, the students were bringing up. For example, uh, in, in a very deep sense, the students were at the forefront of providing critique on concepts such as value, what, how do we attribute value, and, and money measurement concepts and, and reporting and all that. So I, I think overall, we, we felt that it provided a good foundation uh, for, for, for us and the students in, in expanding decolonization and sustainability on the course. Thank you, I had the bell go. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Great timing, Charles. I had a feeling you were probably coming to the end. Um, so just look, to, thank to you run. so much to the, to the three of you. Thank you so much. This was such a rich presentation and this is always such an enjoyable session at the end of the year when we hear what these projects have done in the LIFT programme because they always go so much further and go more exciting and more deep than even people have envisaged at the beginning. Um, now we'll have just, a, we'll take a few moments just to talk. Um, I think we let the presentations go on for a few more minutes because they're just so interesting. Is there a question in the room? Because if not, I have about five questions jumping in my mind. Um, I think one of the things I would just say to you all, thank you, is that I loved how we could see that connection in what you were doing between the decolonization and the sustainability. And it's just so fascinating about hearing about how in a course where we know that the stereotype is a student who just likes to play with their own calculator. And instead there they are talking about all those things and challenging you and leading the conversation. It is, as Margaret said, this is brave education for a challenging world. And I think that what you really brought out a lot for me was the, the sort of confidence needed. And in a way, what I was interested, I think what I'd be interested to ask each of you, or maybe just one of you wants to comment, I don't know, is I know that you, while you've been doing this in your own curricula, you've also been going out and talking with our school senior management teams about the decolonization agenda and so whether through your own experiences you've been having with the students or through the conversations you've been having with your colleagues have you got a sense of where people really are in terms of what's most challenging and important to wrestle with in order to bring this brave education forwards yeah I think Oh, go on. <laughs> go on, Sam. Go on, go on, Sam. Okay, well, I would, I would say, so 
what's been really interesting is that it, a dealer's project again is very different from ours as well mm -hmm. and so we've got three very different modules and that was really good actually for us to understand and establish how there are these different approaches and then going out through to the schools we've seen of course again that every school has a particular way that they like to do things and us coming in and challenging that has been interesting set of, of, of conversations but it, i think it's really like you said there's a, there's a certain amount of bravery that's required but but not necessarily in the so charles and mohammed of course did the, a very kind of uh, really out there kind of project which is absolutely fantastic whereas i think adela and i did much more kind of how can we um just change the focus of what we're doing uh not necessarily the kind of overall methodology and so what we wanted to show people is actually there are these different approaches that you can take and it doesn't have to be like it doesn't all have to be one particular way because i think a lot of people will find that very challenging and we've, we've found some pushback on on those kind of uh you know uh ways of, mm -hmm. of thinking what we can do is actually just it's it's about changing people's views of the world and kind of opening out and broadening people's view of the world and so that can be achieved in in different ways Mohammed, you wanted to yeah absolutely yeah, i think got a couple uh, of questions as well so maybe if you can do a brief one quickly, and then we'll yeah, take yeah. some of the other so, questions so that come up absolutely as as um sam sam says i mean it's it's all, all about expanding people's mind um in in in, in well in class and what that requires is also as a lecturer to also expand our minds in terms of the methods that we are using. Um, and and this is again coming back to what the previous presentation said and also Faruke also talked about it, which is all about structures. And, you know, mm -hmm. Faruke, if I remember correctly, said that, I mean, if you want to decolonize um, the curriculum, you have to be okay with falling foul of those structures really attacking the structures and potentially being you know the bad guy now the luck that we have is that um the university through its leadership um is basically really pushing this which means as a lecturer if you were doing it you wouldn't normally be seen as the bad guy maybe in terms of the way in which you've been doing things in the past you would feel a little bit um you know you need bravery but the university wants you to have that bravery wants you to go out there explore and again it's all about learning and you know improving things as um as we move along basically brilliant thank you now i'll just see if we can quickly get through a couple of the questions we had darren and then jenny and kenny darren i don't know i was looking at a comment did that answer your question or were you would you like to ask another one yeah, kind of. Um, I'm really interested how it actually permeates through the rest of the curriculum because the project's brilliant, absolutely fantastic, really, really inspiring. Um, but how does that permeate then through the rest of the curriculum, other other modules, other levels? Really interested to see because it's an evolutionary process, obviously. Um, but just really interested to see what the next steps are for your particular course areas. Yes, I mean, I think that that basically has again a conversation with all the uh, module tutors i mean within the whole team um and in terms of that conversation it's all about understanding that people are at different speeds with again that bravery um and you know being okay with also learning i mean for us when charles says that we had those you know jittery moments where we had to think on our feet and learn continuously for me personally, my philosophy of, the, I mean, you know, higher education is that the lecturer is someone who learns, I mean, is a student in itself. Um, you know, otherwise we will be ending up giving 1990 education in 2021, which is, yes, I mean, not what we are supposed to do. The world changes and therefore a lot of the things that we have to do also have to change. Um, so it, it really will have to be a question of having these conversations. And this is why we are here today. Um, not just to look at how it permeates within our courses um, and our programs, but then how it permeates within the whole university. Um, and that's why we want that, you know, sort of um, in uptake, let's say, of these philosophies, these principles uh, within within all courses. Can I can I add a word, a brief one? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. So I think what we can expect is that every school will be having this conversation. So uh, that's the the expectation we we have been given that the decolonization conversation is now going to the school level uh, so that it can be embedded uh, in the culture of the university. So look out for a conversation wherever you are. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And it's part of that. Similarly, sustainability is a conversation to take into your own specialist space and understand how the big picture makes sense in your patch. Jenny, what's your quick question? Yes, thank you all. It's, it's wonderful to hear you again. I've heard you speak a number of times on this and of course each time the projects have gone that little bit further. So there's more and more reflection, which is wonderful to see. The question follows on, I think, from yours a little bit, Alex, and it's um, slightly personal, but hopefully will open out into a conversation that's relevant for all. Um, as you know, in the ADU, we're trying to run workshops on embedding inclusion in the curriculum and you've come and supported those. So my question was, as other people are starting, as it were, when you think I want to do something, how do I begin? Were there models, because quite a few models and toolkits exist out there now that, that you found particularly helpful and perhaps more interesting for everybody else, sort of why, what were the questions they asked that we should be asking ourselves and what are the structures just to make sure if we're highlighting and flagging some of those models or ideas or questions or toolkits that we're sort of reiterating what you found works rather than we've got a very different set to you. So where did your ideas come from? Was there anything out there in the literature and what was their nature so we can get a flavour of what they were like? Perhaps one person could answer and everybody else drop some thoughts in the chat and then we can just get the last project and done as before we wrap. Whoever's brave enough to go so, first. I, I, I'll, I'll take that one. So uh, for me, the, the challenge was looking at the kind of the lenses which we look at behaviours and looking at all the kind of decolonisation um, uh, literature that was really focused on kind of removing the colonial lens from everything. So where, the way that we look at the world is defined by our history and our, our, the co cultural context which we sit in. And for me, particularly because as a marketer, we're, we're all about kind of behaviours and understanding human human behaviour and communicating that, that it was a the challenge for us was to see actually how can we how can we remove that Western lens? And once I took that approach, everything became quite easy to kind of slot that into place. But it was it was that initial realization that actually it was that lens that was sat in front of us that was that was defining what we could see. So when when we look at social media, we can only see things from a very American and UK perspective. All the literature is written from from you know uh, from that viewpoint. And so once I took that lens off, it became much easier to kind of approach it. So that that was the way that that was the the, the sort of um, approach that I took. So it was it was kind of looking at what people had spoken about before. Uh, rather than like a specific model or or you know a defined approach, it was more a, a state of mind, as it as it were. I know that's a bit of a hippie kind of <laughs> response to that, but uh. it's a good answer though, Sam, because actually I know that you guys you've curated a really good resource list. There's a great Talis list if anybody would like to go to it. Now I've got to keep us moving. I'm so sorry, we've got oh, one oh, more okay. project to okay. squeeze in in 15 minutes. Henny, is your question super quick? Could you do it super quick? I've got a quick question, but it's probably a long answer. Uh, no, it's just uh, the student reaction. I was just interested in how the students responded because I have tried to to do. I mean, you make the stuff look like it's fun, and I, you know, I have an objection to the idea of learning is fun because that's <laughs> naff, but inherently in the learning. What I'm interested in is how the students reacted to it. Well, so uh, in terms of student reaction, we, we, we we really saw a bit of a fractious relationship. I mean, every now and then, uh, people uh, pushing back and saying, this is not what I expected in an accounting class. Uh, I didn't expect to be given the responsibility, uh, but we, we, knew, uh, we knew that there was going to be that tension, as I said, between the emotive and the cognitive. I mean, they are so entangled that you, you can't really separate it. So, we, we needed to have those conversations because there were shifts that we we, we intended on creating shifts in in worldview 
uh, which which meant that there were a few fallouts. We we dealt with some complaints. I mean, we have we will not talk about that. We <laughs> dealt with some backlash. I mean, I know. I mean, in the school, it wasn't popular. I mean, uh, what are these guys doing? Colleagues were kind of. Uh, we heard you're doing this. Why are you doing that? He was the crazy <laughs> Charles. But hey, that's fine. So, so you're right, Kenny. It's it's not uh, it's not fun, but it's fun because we know in the long term it's rewarding. Yeah, and and, and please don't let that Thank basically you, discourage you. Please don't let that that backlash discourage you guys because in the I end, I am inspired. The I am inspired Absolutely. by you all. I feel like I've, you've given me permission to be the bad guy forever. It's wonderful. Listen, thank you. We must go along and just squeeze in one more final project. Um, this is my very good colleague, Miriam Webb, in the sustainability team. He's just going to talk to you about, very briefly, about um, what we're doing to meet a similar sort of need to the one you've just heard about in decolonization, which is how do we provide you with some resource and material that can work for anybody in different parts of our curriculum portfolio. Um, we've been wanting to do this for quite some time, never have enough time. And actually the pandemic almost gave us a bit of a moment where we couldn't do other things and we could get going on trying to create a resource which we've just started, and Miriam will tell you about where we've started. It's trying to bridge a gap that we see between how we speak about this very bold sustainability education and what it's like actually applying it on the ground in the real world. So when we talk to our professional partners, they talk about the skills for change in a different way. How do we bridge that gap in the ways of talking about it that are educational and very industry focused? And how do we help ourselves to learn and do this stuff quicker? So Miriam's just going to tell you very briefly what we've been up to. We're probably going to run and out of time for Q&A, I know she won't mind, but one thing I do just want to say, I know Miriam will forgive me for the long waffle, but one thing I do want to say is that for us, this is part of us developing our next sustainability strategy. And what we really want to know from you all is what else you need for sustainability education resources. So even if we don't have time to talk about it today, if you can drop any thoughts in the chat or drop us a note afterwards, if there's anything that occurs to you about, ah, oh, what I'd really like you to put in the kit is, please tell us. Right, thank you, and over to you, Miriam. You can do your best for the last 10 minutes. <laughs> Okay, super. So I'm just trying to open uh, presenter mode of uh, PowerPoint. So hopefully that will come up for you. Can somebody let me know if you can see hopefully just the yeah. slide? Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, I will forgive your waffle, Alex, because actually you've covered some of my uh, my top points in a, in a really neat summary there. So hopefully that will help me uh, jog through this uh, in, in a really uh, rapid and efficient way. But um, first of all, yes, thanks to all the projects that have uh, presented today. It's been really, really great working with you this year um, and hearing about your progress uh, today. So as Alex mentioned, in the next few minutes, I'm gonna try and jog through um, another piece of work that the uh, Lyft Fund has started to develop this year in the form of this um, online set of resources to support curriculum design and professional development in sustainability for both staff and students. So um, just to say briefly uh, something about the kind of drivers for developing this and Alex, um, touched on some of those a moment ago, um, we were seeing kind of increasing uh, levels of interest from both um, staff and students uh, in wanting either more input on um, curriculum design or guest teaching. Um, and also increasingly we were seeing from reports in the employer space that there was more and more interest in looking for graduates that had these sustainability skills, but we needed to kind of make the links for students about what these looked like um, in practice and in a wide range of uh, potential um, career disciplines and outside of those kind of um, subject silos that, that students can kind of um, sometimes get stuck in. The other kind of purpose from the student side was to support um, co-creation, so staff and students um, you know, all learners, as some of the other uh, project leaders said earlier, to be able to work together in rethinking uh, curriculums for sustainability and some practical ways um, that they can do this. So the toolkit will have two kind of key parts, um, building from those needs and responding to those needs, <coughs> excuse me, 
Um, and this will be a mixture of um, curated resources that exist out there nationally, uh, internationally and locally, um, as well as some specific things that we've uh, commissioned this year, which I'll tell you about in a moment. So looking first at part one of, of the toolkit, which is kind of around real world sustainability. And this is picking up particularly on the employability themes, what sustainability looks like in industry. Um, also some uh, resources around sustainability at UOG, because one of the things we're frequently asked to speak on in various different um, contexts and courses is what's UOG doing? Uh, what does this look like in the university context? Um, and critically, this part of the toolkit contains um, real life insights and case studies um, from professionals doing this in practice in a wide variety of, of roles and sectors. Part two of the toolkit is uh, much more directly focused on education for sustainability. So this includes reports and insights on student expectations, but also resources introducing uh, sort of at an entry level, what education for sustainability is uh, and how you can go about rethinking modules and courses with this in mind, a bit like you heard uh, Tom and uh, Co talking about earlier. So this uh, is a useful part of the toolkit, obviously, for academics, but also for students in being able to support driving that change uh, forwards and, and co-creating. So to touch briefly on the three things that we have uh, commissioned or developed uh, ourselves this year. Um, first of all, we have uh, put together a TALIS list, uh, which we will publish very shortly ahead. In fact, all of these resources will be available ahead of the start of the next academic year. So we've got a TALIS list of all our kind of favourite resources. So the things that we're often emailing to academics or to students when they say, oh, have you got a thing on such and such? So we thought we'd put them all in one place um, and under you know, relevant headings so you can just kind of dive in and select what you need according to uh, what you're doing. And then the two key things that we worked with our one of our industry partners, um, the Heaven Company, Veronica from the Heaven Company. She's worked with uh, some of our academics before, particularly with the design teams uh, launching live briefs for students to respond to. Um, so she's got obviously a strong connection with the university already. Uh, but we commissioned her to help us develop some written um, written briefs and also some supporting films with interviews from uh, other um, organisations applying these skills in practice. So I'll show you these as some um, exact examples. So this, um, I should say they're both work in progress. So this um, brief, written brief that you can see in front of you and the film that I'll show you in a moment are kind of nearly there but not quite there. Uh, so this is a direction of travel if you like. Um, so here you can see we've taken the skill um, stakeholder engagement um, and as Alex was saying a bit earlier the um, you know key for us is bridging that academic speak and that um, kind of industry reality but we wanted to distinguish from those generic employability skills to what actual sustainability change skills look like. So whilst some of these have similar labels, we wanted to be very clear about what this means in terms of sustainability and why it's important for sustainability. So in this case, we've got a brief introduction to stakeholder engagement. We've got a little bit about specifically why is this critical for sustainability? And then we've got the case study uh, at the end, which uses an organisational um, example. So I want to show you very quickly uh, a little extract from um, the raw footage of an interview on futures thinking uh, with one of our partners, um, Interface. This is not a finished film. It is just uh, a few bits of the footage um, put back to back. Uh, the finished films will be ready shortly. But I thought it would be useful to just um, to just show you this uh, before before we wrap up. So. Hopefully, uh, this you should be able to hear this. If there are any issues, Robin will drop the perfect. Robin, thank you. Drop the link in the chat. So let's see if this works. Hi, I'm Veronica Heaven, founder of Briefcases, linking business and education. I'm delighted to be here today at Interface headquarters in Birmingham with Becky Gordon, who is the regional sustainability manager, UK, Ireland, and the Middle East of Interface. Today, we are talking about futures thinking, or what some may call futures envisioning. 
and exploring some of the skills around sustainability practices. Futures thinking is having the ability to conceive or to rethink existing goals, and it may require you to abandon some long-held assumptions, moving away from the current status quo to a new reality. Thank you, Becky. Thank you for inviting us here to Interface. You're very welcome. It's lovely to have you here. Um, Interface is known as a sustainability leader and for the pioneering vision of your founder, Ray Anderson. Can you tell us a bit more about how Interface's sustainability journey developed and what it means today? It was a customer question that kickstarted this. So it came from one of our customers asking Ray Anderson, what is your company doing to the environment? And he didn't have an answer back then. It was the mid 90s. Not many people did have answers about sustainability back then. But it really inspired him to start to look at what sustainability could be. And he knew that he wasn't best placed to really come up with that direction or have all the answers. So he assembled what we call our dream team of sustainability and biomimicry experts. They were external experts who could shape our path and sort of put it in the right direction when it came to sustainability. And this dream team came up with Mission Zero, which was our aim to have no negative impact on the environment by 2020. So this was the mid 90s. This was a really bold, audacious goal at that point in time. And we had to do a lot of innovation to get there. So firstly, you have to look at where the impact is within your business. And for us, we make things. Our impact is in our products. We make products from virgin petrochemicals not the cleanest of industries. Um, so we really had to innovate in lots of different areas. And one thing that Ray did which was really exciting was to challenge each of our manufacturing sites to really see what they could do individually as teams to advance the sustainability sort of efficiencies and renewable energy and all the processes within our factories to make our products as sustainable as possible. Now to do that, you obviously have to inspire everyone within your organization. You can't just have people with sustainability in their title trying to achieve these things. Um, it has to be throughout the entire organization. You need your engineers, you need people working in your factories to really be on board with everything. I think it's important to mention that I didn't start in sustainability. That's where I am now. But I've worked in lots of different departments at Interface. And it's Interface's drive on sustainability that got me interested in sustainability. Life. It's wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, so I'm conscious that we are uh, nearly at time now, so uh, there isn't uh, so much time for taking any kind of feedback or thoughts from you, but if you do have thoughts and suggestions, um, drop them in the chat. Um, we're interested in where this could go ahead at the start of the next academic year and particularly uh, a place in which you would most like to access this. We'd initially considered Moodle as an option, but obviously we very quickly learned that that was not going to be uh, the, the best place. But we want this resource to be engaging um, and accessible to both staff and students. So we're just exploring the right ways in which we can host this um, for it to be useful to you. Uh, thanks, Alex. Thanks, Miriam. Perfect timing. You didn't need my singing bowl, but I'm sure everybody would love it. So I'll do one right at the end. Um, look, I've let it run on and I know Miriam's going to forgive me that we haven't had a Q&A on this. Um, I think hopefully you can see exactly where the idea of the toolkit resource is going in that we know as a university, we really want to be supporting our graduates into a very changing workforce and labour market and giving them an edge. We also believe that sustainability is one, going to be one of those really distinctive edge things that we can give our graduates to go out and be successful as well as happy in the world with what they're doing in their work and life beyond university. I think what you've hopefully seen from today's selection of projects is that really Sustainability education and the mission of the LIFT programme is about being more than a specialist. It's about being that different professional that we're all very rapidly trying to learn how to be and so that we can bring this change and develop a fairer, greener world through what we're all doing in work and in life more widely. Um, like I say, this, this business of how we get this right for our students and their professional development is something that greatly concerns us for our next strategy in sustainability and for the university's employability strategy. So if you have any feedback about this, about what do we need, what do you need to get it right 
in the course space and in course design, please let us know. And just meanwhile, then I will wrap up now and just say a very huge warm thank you. Please join me, colleagues, by dropping your thanks in the chat for all of our presenters today, Amy and Margaret and Tom and Mohammed, Sam and Charles and Miriam. You've given us some brilliant stories today. I hope that you've all found this very rich and very informative as I have. And thank you very much for being part of our Lift Lab today. Um, I have one little housekeeping thing, which is to say, please remember to vote before one o'clock for the postgrad um, presentations. And finally, we will go off just by a little meditative singing boil nose to have you all a meditative day and a peaceful day in the sunshine. Thank you.